For those of you who are unfamiliar with film, film is a photographic medium that records images using light-sensitive chemicals instead of a digital sensor. Film works when photons hit the light-sensitive crystals on the film and cause a chemical change in the film that creates what's called a latent image. That latent image becomes an actual image when the film is developed in film processing chemicals. This video discusses Kodak Tri-X 400 film and looks at how to use it, the film's characteristics, the technical details, and sample images. Kodak rates Tri-X 400 at 400 ISO, which is 27 DIN. However, it has an amazing ability to withstand abuse. And as you'll see in this video, I exposed it successfully from ISO 50 up to 3200. There, I did experiment with 6400, but it didn't go very well. Uh, Kodak did not indicate how they arrived at the ISO rating, so I think it's fair to assume that they used standard ISO uh, measurements and techniques to ascertain the 400 ISO film speed. As of this recording, Tri-X is available in 35mm, 120 Tri-X is one of my favorite films. It's certainly my favorite 400 ISO film. And it's hard for me to ascribe a set of subjective characteristics to it as I typically do here because I'm admittedly very biased towards this film. Tri-X behaves somewhat differently at each ISO that I've tested it at. It retains a lot of grain with some developers and some speeds, but it can also lose grain with other developers and at other speeds. Tri-X has nice contrast across the board regardless of what your exposure ISO is, but the level of shadow and highlight detail changes as you change your exposure ISO. I find the Tri-X grain to be very pleasing, more so than HB5 Plus for no good reason. I also like the tonality, the tonal range, and the gamma that Tri-X provides in most of the usable exposure ISO range. I also want to note the tonality and tonal range are different Tonality has to do with how well the film transitions from one tone to the next. Tonal range with the overall total, what we in digital terms call dynamic range. How many different tones it can handle. As I said, I've shot Tri-X uh, 400 from 50 to 3200 ISO, which is a six stop range, and had successful usable images at each of those ISO settings. It performs well at each of those speeds. When I got beyond 3200 ISO, it did not perform well. Tri-X has excellent acutance with nice sharpness and contrast that complement the acutance nicely. Until I push Tri-X 400 to 6400 ISO, or in cases where I underexposed images on accident, Tri-X lost its acutance quickly. But in all other cases, regardless of exposure ISO the or the developer. Tri-X had very nice acutance, sharpness, and contrast in the finished image and on the negative as well. Tri-X is one of those very few films that you can learn on because it's very forgiving and then continue to use at any skill level for most any subject and always have a pretty good sense that it will not let you down. Tri-X is amazing for portraits. The way that it captures skin tones is very nice. It would be good if newspapers still use film. It's fantastic for street photography. Uh, for documentary work, also very good. There's a lot of room to use Tri-X for art photography, as well as, like I said, for learning. Tri-X would be a superb black and white wedding film, especially since it can be pushed to 1600 ISO without too many compromises, and 3200 ISO if you're willing to lose a lot of tonal range, but retain sharpness and contrast. And that means that if you're doing a documentary style wedding shoot, for instance, Tri-X is a pretty good option to put in your bag when you go to take those photos. Tri-X converts well to a digital medium. The sharpness, tonality, and detail are well within the ability of digital transfer technologies. I've had Tri-X scanned and it does pretty well. It's a little bit higher contrast when it's scanned compared to when I use my di uh, digitization with a DSLR. So, when I digitize with my DSLR, my images all come back in RAW. Editing Tri-X negatives in a RAW editor is a, an absolute, it's a real delight. And the RAW files contain far more data than, than 
it seems like they should, and it allows you to really pull a lot out of it. The negatives themselves contain more information than the raw files ever will. And so when you're using a DSLR to digitize this, there are really very few, if any, compromises when you shoot with RAW. Uh, if you can shoot, if you can digitize into a TIFF file, that's also a very good option for scanners that do that. Uh, one downside to Tri-X is that due to its grain structure, and this specifically has to do with working with Tri-X in Photoshop or other photo editors, when you clone images or um, faults, in the image in Photoshop, especially, and I'm using CS6, the grain structure on Tri-X can leave a cloning scar on the image if the cloning occurs in a tonally similar area like a sky or a wall or something like that. So you need to have careful and cautious cloning techniques, and cloning on this film will take a little bit longer than it does with some other films to prevent those cloned areas from looking like cloned areas. And the cloning scars on these manifest as a, uh, a round circle or diffuse roundish area that looks like the grain st structure suddenly changes. And that, that sets off uh, red flags for, uh, pe for in terms of, it, it's very distracting if one of these clone scars jumps out at you when you're looking at one of these photos. The Tri-X spectral sensitivity here is for the rated ISO. Now this will change, or at least it will appear to change, if you push or pull the film. Pushing and pulling the film won't change the properties of the emulsion or the way it records light, but it will change the way that the negative relays information in the recorded image after development. This chart has something that previous AAF videos charts have not had, which are separate lines for the way that the film is altered by the negative's density. The thin line represents a negative that is only three times thicker than the base fog, whereas the solid line represents a negative that is 10 times thicker than the base fog. I'll explain how to read this and what this means in the characteristic curve section, which is next, but basically this is telling you what happens if you underexpose your film or have thick base fog. So what we see in these charts is a film with a nice range of spectral sensitivity and a nice extension into the UV range, making it a good choice for scientific work. For most of us, however, Tri-X's UV sensitivity will never have any effect on the images since glass blocks UV light. So unless you're shooting a pinhole or using one of those incredibly rare multiple tens of thousands of dollars quartz lensed scientific lenses, uh, UV lens does not make it through your lens to reach the film. Tri-X is an older emulsion, and which is part of the reason that the blues are more well recorded than the reds. It's just the way that older formulations were made, resulting from the chemicals and dyes that were available and understood in the early days of film. So Tri-X has a lot of orthochromatic film engineering DNA, and more so than many modern film stocks. Now that also plays out in the relatively flat characteristic curve, which we're going to see in just a moment. What that means in practical application is that blue subjects will be lighter than green, yellow, and red subjects of a similar tone. In the previous segment, I mentioned that image density has an effect on the way that the film records light or more accurately displays the recorded light once it's a fixed negative. So let's first understand something about base fog. Here's the curve with base and fog marked. Sometimes this is called gross fog. The inertia point, which is this bit, has a density rating of 0.1 times the base and fog density. Now the inertia point isn't derived from complex scientific calculations or measurements. Instead, it's simply the point at which a typical human eye can perceive a difference in the density versus the base fog density. So this point is somewhat subjective and can vary for each film, exposure ISO, or development regimen. So when the previous chart shows a density of 0.3 times, uh, of three times the base fog, that was three times the inertia point's density. A density of greater than 1.0 of the base fog would be 10 times the inertia point's density. 
So the difference between the, the, the three times and the 10 times is three times as dense as the human eye can start to perceive and 10 times as dense. After the inertia point comes the toe. This film has a nice and gentle toe. The toe is the part of the film that records shadows and shadow detail. So a nice gentle toe like this means the film has the capacity to retain a range of tones within the shadow areas. After the toe, we have the straight line or gamma section. Now this is the fun bit. This line here shows the slope of the density curve. The steeper the curve, the more contrast the film develops more quickly. The more gentle the slope, the less contrast the film develops. The contrast is simply the difference in the emulsion density between areas on the film. That's how we perceive contrast. A gentler slope means less density variation, means less contrast. So we're looking at the 12 minute time here. That's a stupid level of contrast for this film. I developed Tri-X in stock D76 for 7 minutes and 30 seconds and find the contrast from that time to be very pleasing. Developing Tri-X 400 in D76 stock for 12 minutes would give this film more contrast than most images and scenes would really benefit from. The shoulder area is where the highlights begin to show in the developing. A steep shoulder means that the highlight can blow out quickly and lose detail. A gentle shoulder, like Tri-X has, means that the film can tolerate highlights and retain detail in the highlight areas. The D-Max is the maximum density that the film allows. Now that isn't exactly shown on, these, on this data sheet, but as I understand it, it's at or slightly past the end of these lines. The D-Max is the point at which no recoverable highlight data exists. Kodak is fantastic about providing reciprocity data. Want to take a 100 minute exposure? Well, go for it. They tell you how to do it in their data sheet. And yes, that actually does happen. And previously, when architectural photography was all film, uh, that happened fairly often. Interior architectural photography, for instance, often required exposures of 30 to 90 minutes before artificial lights were easily moved and set up. Now this goes back into the days of the 50s, 60s, 70s, up into the, even into the 80s a little bit. And a lot of interiors, especially churches, are pretty dim, when, older churches especially, and they also have a lot of finishes like dark wood that absorb light. So very, very long exposures were not uncommon. And this is something that Kodak does very well. They throw technical information at photographers. There is very little or no guesswork when it comes to using Kodak films in terms of how to use them correctly. The reciprocity chart on this film is pretty easy to read. The little square in the upper left is for exposures that are metered from 1 to 10 seconds. Less than 1 second and no compensations needed. So the row along the bottom of the small chart shows you the number of seconds your light meter tells you to take the photo for. The column on the left of the small chart shows you how many seconds you need to expose your film for. Now the larger chart is for metered readings beyond 10 seconds. And this is in cases where your meter is telling you some number of seconds greater than 10. So let's say, for instance, that your meter, that you meter your shot, you take out a handheld meter, and it tells you you need an 80 second exposure. You actually need to expose Tri-X 400 for about 15 minutes. Now, fortunately, Tri-X has a very straight line reciprocity failure property, so calculating for metered readings beyond 100 seconds isn't difficult. Tri-X's contrast profile responds very differently to different chemistry. Now, this chart shows Tri-X exposed at 400 ISO. The contrast profile changes even more when it's exposed at other ISOs. What this chart tells you is how much contrast the images will have based on the selected developer and developing time. So you can see three sample images on the left. The developing time is the chart's horizontal axis and the density is the vertical axis. So to find out how much contrast your images will have, know your developing time and draw a line from that time to your developer. The higher on the vertical axis your intersection of developer line and developing time, the greater your contrast. So pause this video for a moment and use the chart to find the intersection of time and developer for the three sample images on the left. You can from that see how contrast can be interpreted from this chart.
I've tried a number of different developers with Tri-X. D76 at three different dilutions, LC110, which is the same as HC110, uh, Dilution B, which is 1 plus 31, Rodinol, Ilfasol at, I believe, two different dilutions, and RPXD all made it into this video. I liked the way that Tri-X worked with diluted D76 the most. RPXD was only okay and Rodinol was fine for Tri-X when I pulled it to 125 ISO. Rodinol 1 plus 25 was okay for pulling. Rodinol did not work well in general, I felt, when the film was pushed. I greatly disliked the results from LC110, which, like I said, is the same stuff as HC110, but it's made by a different maker. Ilfosol 3 was also a bad combination with this film, and I strongly suggest avoiding Ilfosol with Tri-X. Tri-X can be pushed far beyond what Kodak indicates for it. I pulled it to 50 ISO and I pushed it to 6400. I liked the results from 125 to 3200, and that's a heck of a great range. And yeah, you can get usable images at 50 and 100. They start to get a little bit flat at that point. One of the most amazing things about this film is how well you can push it and how far it can be pushed beyond its rated ISO. Now, the massive development chart lists times for at least one developer for Tri-X from 50 ISO up to 3200 in third stop increments. So whatever ISO you shoot it with, there is some developer combination available with existing data on the massive development chart. There's so much information about how to use this film out there at your fingertips that you basically won't ever have to pioneer anything that you do with this film, and that's really fantastic for making sure that whatever you do to this film, you're going to be able to get somewhat consistent or quality results. I like Tri-X at most of the ISOs I tried it at. I even like the way that at 3200 ISO, it delivers contrast for certain subjects and settings. Now, when you get into that really high range, the contrast is so great that it's not suitable for most types of use, but a high contrast look can be really interesting as well uh, if you are going for that in one experiment with it. If you shoot street photography, give this a shot at 3200 ISO, and that's going to give you a very high contrast, bleak look with really dark shadows and bright whites. Um, sort of like a photographic version of the old Sin City comics. Now, Tri-X works very well at the rated speed of 400 ISO, and I think that's a really good place to start with it if you're new to this film. Playing around with it is a lot of fun too, but at 400 ISO, Tri-X delivers consistent, predictable, and very high quality results. That's really the highest praise I think a film stock can receive. I like Tri-X also in each available format. It's a different film in each format with a different image aesthetic. The negative size in 35mm enhances the grain a great deal and loses some of the dynamic range. I feel like Gordon Ramsay saying how close and hard this decision is, but the master format trophy would go to 120 by a hair if such a trophy existed. So I love Tri-X. I like shooting lots of different films, and Tri-X is one of those films that I'm really going to miss using while I continue this series. Tri-X brings a lot to the table in terms of image quality and character. It's as versatile as a Navy SEAL and as reliable as gravity. Work with the film and trust it. And as long as you don't completely muck something up, Tri-X has your back.